Welcome back to The Bible is Art, where we explore the literary artistry of the Bible. And this week, we are looking at the literary structure of Genesis chapter 1. In last week's video, we looked at the two main ways that biblical authors organize, structure their stories, and that is parallel and symmetrical organizations, literary structures. And if you haven't watched that video, go ahead right here and watch it because that'll be helpful for what we look at this week. Because this week we are looking at the literary structure of Genesis chapter 1. Now, the first obvious thing that you notice when you read Genesis chapter 1 about how it's organized is that it's organized into seven days. And so it's this linear sequence where you have one day after another. But when you start looking at the days themselves, you start to see that there are connections between certain days that when you start putting the pieces together, you get a really fascinating picture of how the author has organized this first scene. So let's look through these connections. So in day one, you have the creation of light. In day two, you have creation of sky and sea, or the organization of those things. On day three, you have the creation of land. And then on day four, you start to see some connections with days that have gone before. Because on day four, you have the sun, moon, and stars created, which is connected in some way that we will look at to day number one when light was created. And then on day number five, you have birds and fish created. Well, that seems to go with day number two when the thing in which the animals live, namely sky for birds and sea for fish, is designed or created. And then on day number six, you have land animals and you have man and woman created, those land creatures par excellence. So when you start putting these connections together, you see that there are sort of two sequences, two parallel sequences. And so days one through three is one sequence, and then days four through six parallels that sequence. Now, that's the first step. And a lot of times when you're looking at a great piece of literature or art or film and you start noticing some connections and you say, oh, I think something's going on here, you have to take that next step and to ask, well, what weight, what, what load is this carrying in the story? What, what does it do for the theme or the thesis or the characters or the plot development in this story? And so let's look at why our author is doing this. Why is he making these connections? And there's three reasons for this literary structure. Reason number one is that our author wants to communicate that this main character, or what we should say, what the main character is, is trying to communicate, is that He's not just bringing things into existence, but he's organizing those things in a certain way. So the literary structure, the fact that it is precise and, and you have these correspondences and it looks designed, is meant to reflect the design that the main author is doing. So it's 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 not just that this person is like like think about if if to an architect it's so it's not just the creation of lumber or trees but it's taking those things and making them into a house and in Genesis chapter 1 it's a three-tiered house 
So the first thing is to just communicate about how this main character designs his world and doesn't merely bring it into existence. I shouldn't say merely, right? Doesn't bring it into existence. The second reason we, in order to understand the second reason, we have to look at the specific verbs that are used and how these two sets of days correspond. Because in the first three days, you have spaces created, location, settings. So you have the light area, sky-ish area. Then you have sky and sea. And then you have land. And then in the next three days, you get those spaces filled up with inhabitants, creatures, or, or, or things. So sun, moon, and stars fill up that space, that light space and darkness space. Then you have birds and fish filling up those spaces. And then you have man and land animals filling up those spaces. But it's it's not just filling up those spaces, because if you look at the verbs that are used, you see that in day four, the sun, moon, and stars are said to rule over the day. And in day six, it is said that the man is supposed to have dominion over this whole creation, over the land, the earth. And so when you start putting these pieces together, you see that you see that what this character God is doing in his designing this world is that he is designing a kingdom that is not just not just a good physical space, but a sort of social organizational space uh, uh, with hierarchy um, and, and duties and and moral moral obligations. That's reason number two. And then reason number three for this literary structure is that it tells us something about this main character of our story, God. And it tells us that he does subtle things. He does secret things, so to speak. That is, when you take time to meditate on the material about how these these texts are organized and formed, you start to uncover more layers about the plot, about the characters, about the development of the story. Like every great work of art, it has layers. That's one of the characteristic features of great literary genius, is that the more time and attention you give it, the more insights and depth it affords. And so it's telling us this because our character will continue to do this, where if you meditate on his action and the way that he does this action, you'll learn deeper things. So this organization is telling us that it's as important to think about the how of the character's action and organization as well as what it actually is, the content of it. Because the more you consider the form, the means, the structure of his action, the more you will learn about the character in his subtle art.